What should I say? Sabak is sitting next to me. Title is uh, to jump from the um, grasp of the surveillance state. Uh, yeah, that's Tabak. Um, that's welcome to my talk to this evening. Uh, disclaimer at front, I tried to uh, make the slides in the last two weeks. It only happened today. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, be nice to me if I if something is weird or I don't know what to say about this uh, uh, the slide. So um, it's principally I want to show you some technologies, do uh, some technologies of the surveillance state and uh, try and how to uh, either uh, prevent or uh, uh, escape them uh, or uh, turn them against the surveillance state. And we'll start so, uh, with surveillance cameras, uh, pretty good uh, entry point, they're everywhere. The uh, problem with the surveillance cameras is today they don't record pictures, but uh, with uh, if there's a computer behind it, the computer can also do other things like movement profiles, the picture on the left side, uh, they have a look, uh, we will click on a person and they track it uh, them to the picture and in large cities where you have uh, surveillance cameras on uh, every corner, you can uh, track a person from uh, home to work to anywhere else. Um, it's been done uh, before, so in uh, cases of murder, the, it's in the press from time to time where they car uh, followed people from the uh, from the murder scene to, to their house and they just didn't only use the state cameras, but uh, state institution cameras, but they also go to um, kiosk uh, owners and, and other uh, companies. With computers, that's possible even to do even more. There's field tests uh, to recognize um, behavior. Someone runs uh, on the uh, tube station uh, or platform or uh, let's a, a suitcase stand there, and then there's a red uh, light goes on, and it, with, with yeah, with ten thousand cameras in the city, you can't uh, surveil everything as a person, but you need help from a computer. One possibility to uh, go against this is there's several projects to catch uh, catch. No, no write up cameras, zoom levels, uh, angles, and uh, there's Google overlays or over open street map overlays where you, uh, if you, you know, you tell the computer uh, where you want to go from A to B and the, it tells you where to go, how to walk there. Other thing you can do with cameras um, that uh, are in public space there's a facial recognition uh, on Berlin Südkreuz. There's a field test. Uh, there's no results. It's uh, apparently it's totally great. I, I, I'm skeptical about that. Uh, ca the, the last tests in Mainz were catastrophic, uh, cat totally catastrophic. There's like 80% failure rate under bad uh, lighting. Well, we'll see if the, there's going to be results this time. But I'm uh, skeptical that there's uh, more than 80%. Uh, 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 recognition rate and 20%, that means 20% rare failure rate, and that means 20, uh, means thousands uh, uh, a day, persons a day uh, flagged as terrorists or other potential uh, criminals. So what um, can you do to circumvent or uh, get rid of that? Uh, ski mask is the first of it, but there's uh, easier methods like uh, on the left side, um, there's a picture from the um, blueprint uh, table from the electronic passport. And uh, the things that are uh, marked with a red cross are um, don't work for, for a photo in the biometric passport because uh, facial recognition doesn't work. So if you don't want to get recognized, uh, you can orient yourself on that uh, table and let the, your hair fall into the face, uh, eyeglasses or even a veil or these kind of things. Or on the right side um, are glasses with thick frames. There was a study a few years ago 
Um, a few years ago, they were there were a lot of false positives uh, with people who carry uh, wore uh, glasses with thick rims um, because uh, the uh, facial recognition algorithm uh, chooses um, points in your face, and they found the eyeglass frames that uh, has these points, and then recognize them like, like that. Um, facial tattoos, um, painting your face. Uh, these um, triangles on the face uh, you won't uh, get recognized on the recognize uh, on the on the right side uh, paint eyes or other things on your face as well that's uh, pretty little creepy but the software won't recognize you um, another um, thing is that the cameras are in, as the cameras are active in the infrared spectrum you can just uh, create a uh, Contra light. Uh, the rap Japanese uh, have fancy gadgets, uh, invested uh, privacy glasses um, where there's uh, infrared lights around your glass, uh, our eyes, um, infrared LEDs. And the human eye won't see this. It just looks like uh, glasses with a thicker frame, but if you turn them on, it's so light that the person can't be recognized by the cameras anymore. Here it's um, it's not really to show um, to to escape the technology, but uh, the, that the technology is uh, pretty faulty, and that I, when I as I come from the from the area of uh, circumventing biometry, uh, because it uh, I inserted this because it shows that it, these systems are very faulty. It's about biometry, so. Um, the f life recognition of uh, facial recognition. Um, the blinking of an eye is an, um, is an um, yeah, the, it, it shows that uh, the blinking of an eye is uh, the, the proof that uh, this person is alive. So we show that this, um, we printed out this picture which shouldn't work. And um, we should see the picture, and uh, it asks us to blink with a blue eye in the right corner, and then we use it. We just do, uh, just uh, use a pen and uh, hold it in front of the picture, and that is uh, has the color of the skin, and then this life um, recognition just uh, checks if there are pixels from the blue pupil, and if it's not there, then the life recognition just thought this person uh, blinked, and then that's uh, it. Also, a really funny uh, idea is that build manipulation, that you can't uh, recognize this from, uh, distinguish it from real persons. There's a scanner that, scanned it, that scans the mimic of the face, and then um, then put it, puts it on a prepared uh, photography. So just translates this uh, tracking to the target persona so you can get like a newscaster and just put words in their mouth if you just give them the uh, input audio signal and the lips will move in sync. MasterCard has developed a biometric system that also tries um, video detection like blink or uh, laugh at the camera, smile at the camera, make a sad face and um, using this system that is relatively easy to circumvent. The next slightly bigger point is the electronic passport, RFID enabled systems in general. RFID systems work by having an antenna, a sender that communicates with a small chip that is uh, in the passport or ID card amongst other places. And that works only if you're close enough to the reader. So normally they have ranges of about 20 centimeters or something like that. The problem is that you can use certain techniques to uh, read these from greater distances. Passive reading, so um, you have the certified reader and the passport is lying on top of it and you're 20 to 30 meters away. You can actually listen to the communication uh, between the two uh, devices if you have the right antenna. And active interference, so if you control the reader, 
you can extend that range to up to one meter. So in the subway, you just go through the car once, and you can read all the passes and pa uh, passports and ID cards at once. If they have a machine-readable zone, these two lines below your uh, image, your passport, that contains the ID number, for example, uh, that serves as a read identification key to get the data, which is a little bit ridiculous because if the key is printed in plain sight, it's well not, not helpful, especially if you consider that many hotels actually take your passport and scan them, which, by the way, is illegal in Germany according to the passport law. So if you're going to a hotel and they're trying to copy your passport or ID card, you can tell them, no, um, that's illegal because of the Ausweisgesetz and they, they cannot do it. Um, what can you do to protect against this unauthorized reading? The easiest way is to just get a piece of tin foil, put it into the passport. You don't even have to wrap it. You just, like one leaf, uh, put it between two pages of the passport. That shields the antenna sufficiently for the reader to um, yeah, not give enough energy to the chip. And so reading from, from the outside is impossible. There's also some fancier covers for passports and ID cards, uh, for example, from Fribot. And they, yeah, they're just lined with uh, aluminum foil on the outside, the rest is plastic and you just put your passport into that, you can still use it uh, the same way as before. Um, and I had so much fun on the airport with this cover when the, the security staff asked, why do you why do you do this? And then you tell them, well, I don't want people to be able to just read this. Um, I was even asked to take off the cover and they, they x-rayed that separately, so completely ridiculous. Anyway, this is a very simple way to prevent unauthorized reading. A slightly more invasive method is the microwave. I would not recommend this. There's uh, several videos and photos of people that tried this, and on the right you can see one of the potential outcomes of microwaves on RFID chips. And this is the result of just a few seconds. The chip actually burns out, and there's videos where you really get um, sudden burst of flame from the passport. And in this case, I'm not quite sure if that passport remains valid. It is valid in principle, also by the same uh, personal advice and pass law. It's valid even if the chip doesn't work anymore. So you just need to find different ways of destroying the chip without leaving a trace. And there's various possibilities. The easiest is really you get a hammer and you just hit it a few times, give it a few good whacks, or you get a, a pin or, and try to puncture the, the chip or the antenna in a way that you can see. Or another way you can do it is a, if, you, if you want to build something, uh, if you're handy with tools, you can just build an RFID zapper. You can find the uh, manual on the internet. So in this case, it's just a one-way camera where you just connect the flash circuit um, with this antenna. And what the zapper does is that the energy that usually would go into the, the flashlight, the flash bulb, so quite a lot of energy at once, and it redirects that into a small antenna. Um, the antenna is placed onto the passport that you want to fry, and then you just um, press the shutter. And the energy that would go into the flash is then delivered into this uh, antenna and it uses an electric um, electric surge, and that pretty much fries the chip without leaving a trace. If you don't feel like building something, you can just use um, induction cookers. We only realized that a few months ago. That also works pretty well. So we have a cell phone here. It is just the, this is a phone um, that has NFC and it reads this card. We put the card on the um, induction cooker, on the induction stove, we turn it on, 
and normally it wouldn't turn on because it has a detection if there's a pen. And there's a very short pulse that tests for that. And this short pulse is already enough to destroy the NFC chip. That means this is really, really easy. Everybody can do this at home. Um, or maybe your parents' place if they have an induction stove. Just put it on there, turn it on, and that's it. Or at least the RFID chip in these um, passports, ID cards, whatever, are fried. It also works with these kinds of uh, anti-theft labels or uh, NFC labels in supermarkets and so on. They're really easy to destroy like this. The next big thing Also coming from the electronic passport, you're actually obliged to give your fingerprints. So anyone who has obtained a new passport since 2005 um, was asked to actually um, have the fingerprints taken. There's various methods to prevent that. This slide shows the more permanent and also more painful possibilities that you might not want to do. The picture on the right looks funny, but it's actually a pretty sad back story. It's from uh, Sweden, where a few years ago, the immigration authorities have asked all the asylum seekers to come into the centers to give their fingerprints. And there was a pretty big a number of people that, out of fear, tried to burn their fingers on the stove. So really permanently remove the fingerprints. Um, and I'm sure that hurts like hell. What I tried once is to do it with, um, with the, the grind, grinding paper. And even when it started bleeding, the, the fingerprint sensor still detected my fingerprints. So they really had to put their fingers on the uh, hot stove for quite a while. I'm sure that was no fun at all. But of course, there's less painful methods, for example, uh, a relatively simple one is just hard work, minaya labor, using your hands and fingers, or just sports like climbing, free climbing, or bouldering. A uh, pretty good opportunity if you do that a lot, uh, and if you just use your the skin and your fingertips a lot, then the uh, fingerprint readers will fail. And of course, it's also something that takes quite a long time. And if you don't want to be climbing the entire week before um, asking for a new passport, for those, we have another uh, experiments that we ran a, a while ago. And we came to the conclusion that instant glue, super glue, works really well to temporarily remove or make unusable your fingerprints. Uh, it's really easy. You just take super glue, put a drop on your f on your fingers. Um, rub it in, don't stick your fingers together, and just to be sure, maybe do it twice. And then the result looks like this on the right and the top left, that's the regular finger scan. And on the bottom right is the finger with um, instant glue applied. And yeah, the passport authorities in this case, they just can't deal with this. But you need a good backstory. In the beginning, we, we just tried it. And a friend of mine was uh, needed a new passport and new ID card, so she doesn't want to uh, give them fingerprints. So we did this um, super glue at home. We tested at home uh, with a fingerprint reader to make sure that there's nothing to read. Then she went to the um, to the burger and to get her new passport. She asked for the fingerprints, and then oh, there's nothing to see. Uh, then the Odyssey began. They first rebooted the computer because they thought the scanner was malfunctioning. Then they went to try a different computer with a different scanner that also worked. It didn't work, of course. Then ultimately they called their superior. And he didn't said, well, just wash your hands. You probably have dirty hands. So sh she went to wash her hands. And the good thing is that this um, instant glue, the super glue, really just it's OK with, with being washed. It's going to stick for, for a day. So in the end, they gave up. They said, oh, it's probably some sort of disease or some genetic disposition. And they gave her a passport without a fingerprint. So there is an option in the fingerprint saying this person doesn't have uh, fingerprints. So you need some good story. And she just said, well, I'm a hairdresser. I'm working with um, 
working with chemicals every day, uh, I guess my, my fingerprints were just kind of uh, burned or etched away. And if you do that in a believable fashion, um, that probably works. It's not a guarantee. I also heard from people that tried, um, yeah, that applied a cast to the hand and they went to get a uh, passport and they were told, please come back in two weeks. We can't do it like this. But in principle, it works. And a different, another different way is to not prevent a reading from, of uh, one's own fingerprints, but to just borrow fingerprints from someone else, just stick somebody else's fingerprints on, either because you don't want to be recognized as yourself. For example, if you're um, passing, crossing the border into the US at an airport, but also if you're uh, doing anything at a crime scene. And indeed, OK, maybe. Um, it's not what you're thinking. The story is that a while ago, there was a supermarket in the south of Germany. They introduced fingerprints for payment. And because that was a pretty new topic back then, we thought to ourselves, well, let's show them that's a stupid idea. And we went and copied the fingerprint. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about that later. We took the fake fingerprint, put it on somebody else's finger, and that person then just went and purchased stuff in the name of the first person without anybody realizing. And the nice thing about this technology, this uh, this technique, and that's just using wooden, uh, wood glue uh, as a medium, is that it's relatively invisible and thin. You can just put it on your finger, and lots of sensors with the vivid detection actually recognize that as skin, uh, living skin, and are easily fooled without any big risk of maldetection or, well, detection. And so you can go and make purchase in somebody else's name. What you could also try is to get a passport with a fake fingerprint, whereas the legal implications aren't quite clear yet. It's not clear if that's a crime, uh, a felony, to glue somebody else's fingerprints to your own fingers. We uh, tried talking that through with a, with a lawyer. We came to the conclusion that they couldn't tell us whether somebody else's fingerprints were identity theft. But what you could do is, for example, take the your, your uh, toe prints and stick those to your fingers. Then he said he, he couldn't imagine any kind of paragraph or law um, that would penalize that. So quickly about how to, how to do this. In round one, you just need to collect the print somewhere. And maybe you've seen this in uh, some TV show after some murder happened. Um, criminal investigators come by and they put this brush and they, they very carefully um, put a staining powder over the fatty residue that fingerprints leave on any kind of smooth surface. And then you just take a photo, um, post-process a little bit, and then you can just print it. So that here is the, the, the image. And if you print it with a laser printer onto a foil transfer, then the toner particles actually create a kind of a of shape. It's not very tall, but it's enough to actually serve as a negative for this fingerprint. So you just take uh, wood glue, just put a little bit on that, uh, leave it to dry, and then just stick it to your finger. So really easy, really simple, something you can do within a few hours uh, at home. The waiting for the glue to, to dry is probably the thing that takes the longest. So it doesn't take a lot of effort or uh, tools. And finding fingerprint is really simple. It's really easy. But to make it a bit more newsworthy, what we did in 2005, 2006, uh, we wanted to show that 
it's relatively easy to get the fingerprints even of VIPs or well-protected people and who would be a better target than the Minister of the Interior. At that time, it was Wolfgang Schäuble. What we did is he was in Berlin and some uh, opening ceremony for some uh, Catholic university, uh, Catholic faculty of the Rumble University. And as usually, he, talk, uh, he drank from a glass. And after the talk, we just went on stage, stole the glass. And using exactly this, te this technique, we copied the fingerprint, or we, we transferred, digitized the fingerprint. And then actually put these uh, fake fingerprints into our magazine of the KS Computer Club. So everybody who got that also got a Schäuble fingerprint that he could use. And indeed, that went pretty viral in the press. It even made it to the Bild Zeitung. And Schäuble's reaction was, yeah, I don't care. The hackers can have my fingerprints. That's his official statement. But I heard from well-informed circles that he was pretty angry. And if you've ever seen Schäuble when he's not in a great mood, he's quite the um, quite an angry person. And yeah, I wouldn't have wanted to be in the same room uh, with him at that time. That was probably no fun. OK, so let's speed up a little bit. The same also works not just on um, smooth surface, but also on paper. You can take fingerprints from. so. If you ever want to write a um, a ransom note and just make sure you use gloves um, and make sure that you dispose of them properly because also the inside of latex fingerprints uh, fingerprints are quite clearly readable and there were some cases here in the spray and graffiti scene. Not just Schäuble was one of our victims but also the Minister of Defense at the time, um, Ms. von der Leyen. And in this case, you don't even have to be close to the person to see the glass or cup they drank from. But in this case, we just showed that it's enough to take a photo from a certain distance. And then from that photo, it's easy enough to extract the fingerprint, um, good enough to create fake fingerprints. In this case, it was at the federal press conference. We asked a photo um, photographer to not just take photos of the faces of these politicians, but maybe just uh, target one of the fingers. In this case, it was one of these, um, just a, a regular or a little better uh, camera of a professional photographer. And from a distance of about six meters, you have a usable photo just here, the, the first two or three rows. If I had a camera here and you would wave at it, I could take a photo of fingerprints from here and use it to create fakes. The same thing also works with iris detection. I'm just going to skip over a few things. The, the video is funny. So this is a uh, iris detection thing. We made a photo, printed that, and now we're just holding the photo in front of the scanner. And this is not a cheap scanner. It's one of the access control scanners that are used in banks, for example. And yeah, just print it, put it in front of your face. And it's so simple that it actually works. Uh, it looks a little stupid if you're doing that when crossing a border. So you have this, this paper, and you're holding it in front of the camera. That's why, alternatively, uh, contact lenses, it's uh, easy enough to, to print these. There's, there's ways to print those. And if you print those with the correct iris pattern, then you can also cross borders this way. For example, at the Frankfurt airport, the frequent flyer programs where you just scan your iris, and then without any further checks, you, you can just go through. So if anyone um, ever does that using a contact lens to sign up there, then just distribute these lenses, or other people just buy the same lens, um, they can enter using the same iris pattern. And that already shows how easily these uh, mechanisms are to circumvent. Now the really fun video. This is Starbuck. Uh, Starbuck is a biometric hacker, and he wants to fool the iris scanner of the new Samsung S8. Well, how could he do that? Well, the sensor works using a camera, so Starbucks 
going to start by taking a photo of his eye. So he invited two friends over, and they're making a photo, uh, taking a photo of his eye. And because the sensor uses infrared, we're going to take the photo in the infrared mode, in the night mode of the camera. That's Starbuck. Looky here, and there we have a photo of his eye. So now Starbucks is going to print that with a Samsung printer. And there's the printout. And then Starbuck is going to lab with this. And this is Starbuck, and he has a Samsung Galaxy S8. So first, he has to teach it to recognize his own iris. And that works well. OK, let's try it. Cell phone locked, tech, recognize the iris, unlocked. Now Starbuck gets a contact lens and puts the contact lens onto the printout of his eye because to make it look more real. And here we see the cell phone. Starbuck's holding up his fake and the cell phone unlocks and that's that. So that shows that even modern devices, this um, was last year only, even with modern devices, there's still ways to completely evade these systems. And another thing, kind of going back to the surveillance state a little bit, and the possibilities to resist against that, DNA analysis is a big thing, especially in, uh, in criminal cases. And again, crime scene investigators take all kinds of swabs, blood, blood, whatever they can find at a crime scene. Then they grow the cell cultures, and then they extract the DNA. And that is then matched with the DNA databases or a large DNA sample that, yeah, that certain groups of people are just um, as to, to give their DNA, it's good to know that this is completely voluntary, so you don't have to do that. If they come to you and ask for a DNA sample, just tell them, no, go away. Should you have the idea of doing anything illegal where you might be at risk of leaving your DNA traces, it's usually not enough to prevent your own DNA from um, remaining at a crime scene. That's pretty much impossible unless you're working in a full body suit like this guy in the, in the photo. So there's a very high chance that you're actually losing DNA traces. But there's a very easy way of uh, preventing detection uh, still, and that is by leaving DNA samples from other people, ideally hundreds, because then um, crime scene investigators are going to have a good time trying to analyze that. And I actually tried to try to find it again. I, I couldn't find the link again, but there are websites on the internet where you can actually order DNA samples in little um, in, in little cups. And you, yeah, you just spill it at this crime scene. That's it. You're pretty safe. Uh, a few closing slides just to actually talk about surveillance and prevention of it. Hard disk encryption, full disk encryption. There's more than enough cases, or actually nowadays in uh, every um, uh, every time police actually goes and, and, and takes any kind of electronics. So they would usually take uh, devices, hard disks, smartphones. So please, please, please encrypt your data. It's not very hard anymore. Lots of computers, operating systems do this automatically by now. But it's a very important point because the risk of seizures, uh, of, of a criminal seizure is pretty high. And if your hard disk and everything is taken, you don't want them to be going through your data um, and find not just private data, but also maybe potentially incriminating evidence. So always encrypt and shut down computers if you're not using them. That's important doesn't necessarily help against the uh, Trojan horse, especially the federal Trojan horse that is legal again in Hesia in Bavaria with the new uh, police regulations. The um, federal Trojan back then was not at least through the CCC uh, prevented. There was a big uh, court case in the constitutional court 
where we showed that this federal Trojan was not just used by the authorities as leverage, but also by any criminal element, because you could show that the Trojan itself offers ways to actually leave traces on computers, and that makes uh, all evidence gathered this way unusable. So let's skip that. And MC Catcher is probably something that some of you might have heard about, tiny devices that emulate cell towers, like, for example, this uh, big tower over there, that's a telecom cell tower. These also come in small suitcases. You just put them close to a person that you want to put on a surveillance. They say, hey, I have a strong signal. I'm your cell. And your phone is going to book itself into that cell. And then it's just going to pass through all the requests that you put into this tower. Um, are going to reach the MC catcher first. And that's just going to forward them to a real cell tower. And so they can intercept and uh, listen into all phone calls and everything, even though the um, voice communication should normally be encrypted. What can you do against that? There is the MC catcher catcher that just looks at the, has a map of cities and just says, okay, in this location, you should be seeing these cell towers with these IDs. If that does not happen, something is fishy, especially like here, the, for example, at, at home, there's always this specific cell ID, and now suddenly from one moment to the next, for the next 30 minutes, there's a different ID um, that's noticeable. And there are apps for Android, at least, that can tell you, hey, um, take care. I think there's something something going on here. A bit more critically, maybe if you're going to protests and demonstrations, the risk of being swept into a uh, tracknet search and the data being used against you, for example, in Dresden or the big anti-Nazi demonstration, there were hundreds of thousands of data requests for mobile phone subscribe identities and that are in use to try and um, yeah, d find and pr prosecute criminals. So a really good idea is getting a demo phone. It's just a collection bin in left projects or wherever where people can go and donate old phones that they don't want to use anymore, or that they bought cheaply on eBay somewhere. Um, and then before a protest, people just come there, grab a phone, use it with not their own SIM card, very important, but some prepaid card that they got in some way that's not registered to, uh, to somebody's name. You can still get them on uh, free markets, for example, even though in theory you would be forced to um, leave your name when you bought them. You, and you just put that SIM card in, and then at least in this demonstration, you're not connected connectable with your own identity and profile. Another thing, the silent SMS is authorities, at least when the silent SMS were used, they were not um, authorized to, to locate phones, but they could subpoena the provider logs. And within the provider logs, the cell IDs uh, were contained, but of course only if the phone actually booked itself into the cell ID and actually had some form of active communication. And so what the authorities did is then they sent so-called silent SMSs, so they initiated that the phone would actually connect into this, uh, the cell it's in, and then they went to the provider and they asked for the locks, and then based on the locks they could see which location the, the people were in at the time, and that only came to light because a few providers had a, a billing problem where they suddenly showed a silent SMS on the, um, on the victim's bills as special services. There's also some phones that actually showed these silent SMSs. And so if you find something like that, it's probably not in use anymore nowadays, uh, but that's a pretty obvious point. GPS trackers, of course, pretty widespread. And we had a few people come to us at a club saying, hey, we, we found this tiny black box on our cars, which is pretty funny. If you open it up, it's just a GPS module and a GSM module. Um, so the, the GPS data is sent onwards uh, with, the, with the phone 
to the phone network. So if you take out the SIM card and then you read out the number that the data is sent to, and you can just call them, you can ask them, hey, who is this? What are you doing? What is this about? And there were some, no, no, there weren't. There, there were no funny um, applications. If any of you is driving a car, then maybe on highways, you've seen these toll bridges. That has now been extended to almost all um, state roads. Here, the, the map on the left is the toll roads before the extension, and the right side is today. So on average, every 50 kilometers, you have one of these surveillance cameras that scans your license plate and sends it to a central authority. So if you want to go through Germany without being recognized, you have to think of ways, something you can do against that. Simple ways are shown here, like slipping with a paintbrush. Oh, we lost the, um, we lost the paint can while passing by. Painting the camera itself is very effective to to disrupt the system in general over the, on its own license plate is pretty obvious. And all the possible ways that I investigated, there's lots of stories like you, you take hairspray and you put it over your license plate. That doesn't work. None of it work. And also trying to make a B into a P. You can try as hard as you will. The B and the P just look differently, even if you fill, fill it in. The manipulation will be visible. And in the worst case, that's actually fraud, um, which is not a fun place to be. Uh, a pretty fun case for nerds amongst you. There's a picture on the bottom right. You probably can't see it very well. It's amongst others. It contains drop table, which is um, a command for databases to to uh, yeah drop the database table, delete the data. So in theory, if this car would go through one of the toll bridges, and that would be using MySQL and that would be vulnerable to a secret injection, then uh, the database will be gone. So one final thing, just because lots of people don't know it still, is that laser printers have an ID. And when printing anything, they actually print this ID with, with everything. It's pretty invisible. It's tiny yellow dots on the left. You, can, you can't really see it very well. That's, uh, whenever you print something with a laser printer, like for example, uh, uh, a ransom note or anything that contains the ID, and there is databases at police authorities that can tell which supermarket, which store, whatever, sold a copy or printer with a certain ID. So it's relatively easy to identify uh, or at least uh, reduce the, the potential suspects um, of where you bought a printer or where you copied or printed this printout. I think that's pretty important. Lots of people still don't know that. If you do something, either use um, analog multiply uh, multiplication techniques or just use old black and white inkjet printers. They don't usually do that. That's all. That's all for my talk. Any questions? I think we have maybe two minutes. OK, I'll be going around with a microphone, and I brought you a matter. Are there any questions? Then I come to you. I'll go to you. Uh, one question. To the demo uh, smartphone uh, phones, if I have a personalized SIM card from someone else, uh, or uh, have SIM cards uh, distribute with them a large group, but well, don't you uh, yeah you can do that, but don't uh, use it. That uh, don't if you do something illegal with a phone in your pocket uh, from some from your friend, then your friend might be. Uh, might be booked for that. That's not a good idea. So um, you can use it yourself, but uh, only for demonstrations. Only put it into into your phone for demonstrations. But not only. Don't only. Um, don't put it in your own phone once, uh, because as soon as you do that, you can lead it back, to, uh, trace it back to you. But demo 
phone uh, is if it's on um, walk around with that with it on then you can see um, how it moved uh, with a uh, with the movement profile and uh, then you can also be traced back I only to turn it off uh, buy a prepaid card on the f f free market I only put it in the phone uh, at the demonstration and after turn it off after and then switch uh, the phone uh, send it to another city that they can use it confuse the authorities does anybody want another question run run forest so is there uh, is there a demo phone uh, station in Berlin? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, in prior to G20, we uh, spread this a little uh, in in our club, and I left it across the projects. We put in uh, put up boxes where people could uh, drop their phone, but uh, I don't uh, know that there's a. S uh, long-term installation like that in Berlin, but it's a good idea to put the uh, put it on the direct. One, one quick question. We can add one more question. Yeah. What do you recommend uh, to uh, protect yourself on the internet uh, from surveillance? That's uh, so a slide I skipped. The anonymization technologies like Tor and VPN. There is uh, the one in Sweden, I forgot, uh, uh, the Swedish VPN provider. I, I forgot it. Swedish, uh, v just search Swedish uh, anonymous uh, VPN provider in Sweden. It's not expensive, you get an IP uh, that is uh, terminates in Sweden where you can't uh, prove I predata. Yeah. And I know the people uh, who run this, and they're pretty reputable. And um, uh, it's uh, safe that when the cops uh, uh, come in there, they, they tell them, uh, fuck you. Uh, we don't have to collect data anyway at all, um, where you have to say that Tor network is uh, a little shady because uh, uh, a lot of uh, financing comes from NSA. It's uh, known nowadays that uh, secret services run a lot of exit nodes and the Tor network uh, has uh, the problem that if you have a certain percentage of exit nodes, you can pretty easily uh, you trace back to the, the source of the packets, but it's uh, better than using nothing. When you browse, use uh, a VPN uh, and encrypt your hard drive and uh, delete your browser history from time to time and uh, use a free and open Wi-Fi uh, to and then search if there are uh, surveillance camera and that's uh, sort of go from one end to the other. Okay, Sabak, thanks a lot. This is your applause. Thank you. Thank you.